Let's wait a few seconds. This on obviously Mercedes versus Red Bull. Ooh. All right. Um, hello, everybody. <laughs> Good. I will uh, again mention it. Let's uh, mute yourself if you're not speaking. Um, let's see as well. If you don't want your face on it, put your camera off. That's very important as well. We will post this on YouTube later um, so you can rewatch the whole session as well. So that's cool for you to know. Today, the Flooded Lightning Talks, a very new session, brand new this year. Uh, we're going to talk about WebAssembly. We've tried it in the past, and now we have two very cool subjects about it, an introduction lesson and as well a deep dive session. So both will be really awesome. Um, we organized the Frontend Lightning Talks with the Frontend team uh, within Society. I will be your host, Gretchen, for today. And we are thriving and trying to make it interactive, inspiring, and informal for you guys. We are with uh, different companies. Uh, we are also with different subjects each year uh, that are all related to front end. And today, I heard it's International Women's Day. So for all the f <laughs> for all the female uh, developers, you are valued as well. We are all developers, and I think the one thing that connects us is basically the passion for IT. So that's really cool uh, that we have that today as well. Well, what's awesome is the program. We have a small introduction, which is what I'm doing right now. After that, uh, Edwin will take over the introduction of WebAssembly. He will talk about uh, 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, we will see about that. It's very informal, so we can have a cool chat as well. Then a small drink break, if we are thirsty, of course, and some little announcements. Then. In the end, we have a developing a visual WebAssembly compiler in the browser with Michael, uh, which will be awesome. If you have some any questions that are not answered during the presentation, those can be handled in the end, and it will be very cool. All right, so who we are, this is not a recruitment speech or anything like that, but we organized this from the front-end community within Society. We do lots of cool things. Uh, we like to game with each other. We like to do these kind of things and share the knowledge. Um, but that's not the only thing we do. We work for some awesome uh, companies as well, name it, and we are working at it. But not only the front, front end side is there, of course, we have Java, we have uh, cloud, we have automation, we have testing, basically everything. And they are also organizing meetups, which is really cool. So the learning spirit is there. Those links will be provided in the end as well. Well, the front end lightning talks is already busy for uh, quite some time, um, but we are trying to improve each year. Uh, this will be the general introduction of the year. So WebAssembly and then front end architectures probably in May, mobile development and some deep dive sessions in September. Then at the end of the year, the impact of UX on code and code and UX, which will be a different session, but really cool. Uh, and in the end, accessibility, uh, CSS. This is subjective to change, and if you're thinking, all right, I want to present, that's also possible. You can contact the leadership team, uh, which is on Meetup. Well, in general, we all want to have different subjects, different speakers, of course, and we all want to have a new branding. So that's for the next time as well. We will go hybrid um, with a cool studio and probably some extra drinks and bites. Now you need to provide it by yourself, but then we will provide it for you. Um, so let's go hybrid. All right. Thanks, everybody. We will now go to Edwin for the first speaker. So if everybody could raise their hands in a virtual applause, that would be really cool for him. So Edwin, you can take the stage and share your screen. Yeah, you might want to uh, to hold off the applause until after I'm done. Oh, you get both, you get both. <laughs> I'll try uh, not to, uh, to disappoint you. Um, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Edwin. I've been... Uh, uh, a part of this community also for quite a while. Uh, and I believe in the previous uh, WebAssembly presentation, I also talked a bit about, uh, I think it was uh, yeah, mostly on Blazor because it just came out with the .NET 5 and everything. Um, so uh, yeah, today I want to show a bit, uh, yeah, just a couple of repeats, but then afterwards I will go into the demos. So then it will be, uh, uh, it can be quite interesting. Uh, just for the people who don't know WebAssembly at all, um, let me just uh, quickly explain what it is. Um, well, uh, 
Yeah, it's mentioned here, WebAssembly is a new type of code that can run in modern browsers. And actually it's a bit broader than that. You can also run it in Node.js or any JavaScript engine. And there are also uh, yeah, engines that can run it by itself. So uh, basically, basically everything that uh, supports the WebAssembly systems interface can uh, can run it. Um, but mostly, yeah, especially for your browser, you will uh, you will have to get access through it uh, through JavaScript, and it uh, and you can go through to that. There is an object in the uh, available in JavaScript to get to interface with it. The coolest part is that you can write. WebAssembly, not in JavaScript, but in any type, in any language that you want, or at least in a lot of languages. Uh, there is quite a long list. I included the list of uh, languages that support it. That's, uh, that list is maintained somewhere on GitHub. Um, and some that I'm actually quite excited about, yeah, uh, the Kotlin, Python, Swift is cool. Of course, the C, the C++, Rust and Go and COBOL is also very nice for those who might want to write it. Um, of course, JavaScript, which, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's uh, beside the point, but uh, you can do it. Um, you have the Java and also the .NET uh, through uh, Microsoft came out with the Blazor and also the Blazor WebAssembly, which is quite cool. And actually, this is one I'm also very excited about the Perl of Fourth and Lisp. Uh, for those uh, really excited about the logical type of languages, we use that for uh, uh, AI programming a lot. So uh, beside Python, also a Perl of Fourth and Lisp uh, can be very interesting to write uh, AI agents, for example, that you can then run in your browser and let them go online and get return in your browser, etc. Can we do very cool things with that if you want? Um, yeah, and that's basically it. So you write something in a language and then you compile it and then you get a WASM uh, file and that you can load into your JavaScript and interface with it. And I'll show you a couple of examples a bit later on. Uh, Microsoft did sort of the same, um, but they made it, uh, yeah, they did an interesting thing where they have uh, Razor components, which were already a thing in uh, in .NET, um, where you write things in C Sharp and you could run uh, the MVC applications on the server, and they made it made it so that these Razor components could also be compiled against WebAssembly, and then you can have them running client side instead of server side, so that you can actually port the components between both. So they did a really cool thing. Also, then, uh, yeah, the, the language you use is the same server side and client side, so to speak. And also the, yeah. So that's a cool thing. Uh, yeah, and what they did is just in the, in the WASM, beside your code itself, they also supply the .NET Core library so that you have the .NET uh, in there. Um, very nice to check it out. I can, I have a bit of an, uh, a small example uh, on how that can work. Um, but yeah, let's not go in that too deep. I also have some, uh, a very nice one I'm using. Uh, yeah, I, I did it C um, demo also because uh, yeah, C is a, a language I haven't done in a long time. Uh, so it's uh, good to have some, uh, some reminiscence. And also you can do very cool things like I'm, I'm going to show you how you can load the wasm into your page but also how yeah I'll, I'll not try not to spoil it i have two demos yeah php is also in there uh, um yeah so i have uh, i have two demos i have one for uh, for a small one as a bit of c code i wrote uh, well not even myself i i stole from someone online uh, and uh, compiling a C library into uh, into WebAssembly, so then you can have your uh, you can load all the C libraries into your browser and access them through JavaScript. And I want to show you this. Uh, it's actually quite easy. Even I could do it. Um, also, there are a couple of nice showcases online, and uh, I found these two. And 
yeah, first I wanted to show you uh, so what they uh, what the people from uh, from AutoCAD is they uh, actually compiled a lot of their AutoCAD code into WebAssembly. So then they have actually the whole AutoCAD program also in the browser. Uh, yeah, of course there is a hybrid pa uh, part to it. Uh, so this is uh, this is AutoCAD. I don't know how it works, so I cannot give you a, de a real demo. I can just show you that it opens. Um, but you can check it out yourself. You can create a free account there and just uh, just play with it. Um, the I was hoping that it would actually show. Yeah, there it is. It would show this part. Uh, I'll just reload it. And uh, well, they have quite a bit of code in there. Yeah, whatever. Uh, so as you can see, this is the 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 fabric backend uh, wasm file. So that's the the WebAssembly file, and it's uh, uh, yeah growing quite a bit. I think it stops at about eleven. Uh, so they have an eleven megabyte uh, part of uh, compiled AutoCAD code, which they're loading for uh, to make sure that you have the, all the AutoCAD awesomeness in your browser. Uh, available. Uh, I thought it was a very good demo, uh, a very cool thing that they did. So I just wanted to show you and uh, and share this. Uh, and just create an account and you can play around with it. Uh, uh, also, uh, so this was another nice demo. I only read an article on it. I'm not doing Photoshop myself. I think Emil uh, made this remark that it's there. But uh, yeah, so Photoshop is also there, and it all, they also use uh, WebAssembly to uh, to load their code into the into the browser, making a Photoshop on the web. Uh, I linked this article here. It's an article on what they're doing. Uh, I couldn't find a link to where it's hosted now, so I think they're still working on it. Uh, but so these are a couple of very nice showcases what you can do with WebAssembly if you want. Um, I also have some useful links here. Also put them in uh, in GitHub. So uh, I'll show that link in a bit, but uh, you can find everything here. Uh, this bottom link, the github.com, I put a repository with my demo code. So if you think my demo code is cool, then you can find yourself and you can do it for yourself. Uh, and all the other links are just to, uh, uh, to do it. Um, so that was the boring part. Uh, me showing a couple of slides. Uh, there is, of course, also this part. This is a uh, I made an intro WebAssembly repository where I put some demo code in. Um, and just to show you how easy it is, there is a couple of preparation steps. Uh, and yeah, so there is an article here. I have to be honest, I haven't done made demos from scratch myself. I stole them from Surma. He's written this in 2018 uh, and it's very cool. So I just copied it from him. To uh, to get this started, I put the code in here so that it uh, so that it works directly out of the box. You can clone the repository then. Um, yeah, like I said, it's a C demo. So for that, you need a compiler that can compile C into WebAssembly and that's mscriptum. Now I didn't want to install and script them on my uh, on my laptop, but uh, there is a Docker image that also uh, that's also available, and you can use that as a compiler. So I just pull in the the, uh, the Docker container, and then you have it available. Um, yeah, and I just for reference, I installed HTTP server, so that's easy to uh, to start up a, uh, a server for the browser. Um, two demos I've made. So the first one is for uh, for Fibonacci. I'll skip to the code now. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm skipping to the code. Now. Yeah, there we are. Uh, the Fibonacci. So I have two files, and one of it is a is a C file, which is yeah basically your uh, mscriptum uh, or your uh, your C function to calculate something uh, for uh, for Fibonacci. Um, it needs this declaration 
uh, C compiler out of the box. If a function isn't used, it will not deliver it in the resulting uh, binary. So you have to mark it as, uh, yeah, that it has to stay there. So that's available after the compilation. Um, but that's basically it. So this is a plain old C. Um, there is an index.html. All it does is when there is a, the compile results are there, it loads them. It loads them into a module. Uh, this crep function is something that mscripten provides that can uh, can create a reference in JavaScript to a function that has been written in C uh, in the assembly itself. Uh, yeah, and then you can use that function to uh, to then call it. So that's it, and uh, not not too much magic is happening there. Um, I am on a Windows machine, and I really don't like to do commands on Windows. So I use my Linux subsystem to uh, to do things like these compilations. Um, and so let's go. Uh, I have the command. Here I'll try to make it easy. So there, there is this is a command. This is a standard calling Docker, right? Up until mscriptm, it uses the uh, the mscriptm image, then has the the m command, the compiler. Uh, what you can see here, the wasm is one, so then it uh, generates the wasm. It's providing an extra C wrap function that you will need in your JavaScript code. Uh, to uh, to have a reference to the function, but then it only compiles the the FIPC. So if I'll run that, it should take a couple of seconds to build it, and then we should see arriving here. Oh, maybe I should be in the correct directory. Uh, Uh, where is it? There we go. That should work. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so that compilation then uh, returns an, uh, a JavaScript file, uh, which is basically just wiring up everything and uh, and the wasm file. Um, and that's it. So now I'm starting an HTTP server. Uh, yeah, all right. I have to start it locally because that's the Linux subsystem. There we go. And now I hope it won't surprise you too much that you can see that the, the 12 Fibonacci is 144, that it runs the code, uh, it calls the, the uh, web assembly. And uh, yeah, there's not too much magic here. Um, just uh, when you're running both of these demos at the same time, uh, make sure that you disable the cache. Uh, if you don't disable it, the browser has a tendency to cache the WASM files because they, they can be quite large. Um, yeah, so then it will load the WASM of the previous demo. And uh, yeah. I'm sure you can imagine how I found that out. Um, yeah, for the second demo is actually a bit more interesting. So this was only a bit of my own code, but uh, yeah, I thought this was a very cool part of this demo. Um, so I did my best to make it work. Uh, what you did here was just take any C library, uh, compile it to WebAssembly, and making all the functions in that library, at least the ones that he needed uh, to make it available in JavaScript. Um, this library is the WebP library, um, yeah, it doesn't really matter what library it is, but uh, uh, just uh, for your 
uh, reference of the web P is a specific codec for images, which is supposed to be optimized for uh, for use in the browser. Uh, there is a lot of information on it, how it works, etc. So you can, uh, yeah, from this part you can dive all into it and uh, doing a sidetrack on uh, on encoding images. But I'm only going to use it to call some functions on it uh, to show you that uh, that you can uh, can encode uh, an image into this. Um, yeah, so that it's and it basically it runs the same way. You have to do uh, so. I cloned this library into a libwebp directory. So if I go here, I'll close the Fibonacci, then with the webp, and here is the library. So this is just a checkout from uh, from the upstream repository. Uh, yeah, and you can see there is actually quite a bit of code there, so I won't bother you and uh, bore you with that, especially because I don't know what it means. So uh, I've been not been into C for too long. Uh, one nice thing to do before. So I did want to show you. Uh, so this is the the version numbering. So it's one two two, and I'm uh, only mentioning it here now because I use it in the demo to show. Uh, let's just close that server. Um, so if I go to Web P, and of course also here, uh, Web P. Now the demo itself, yeah, besides having this library, so this is the library that I'm going to compile. Um, like I said, the functions have to be made available, so you do have to do a bit of wiring, uh, and that's actually this one, the, the webp.c. So this is the file that's compiling, and it has some references, yeah, to stdlib, to, uh, to mscriptum, of course, and also to the level, uh, the WebP library itself. So a lot of these functions are then wired into uh, into Mscriptum. So we supply those functions for version, the create buffer, destroy buffer. Et so there's a lot of uh, memory allocation that has to be done in WebAssembly as well. Uh, yeah, it's C, and you have to do uh, you have to do allocation. Um, yeah, and so it also so it supplies the the encode function to to do WebP encoding. Uh, but that's basically it. So it's just wiring some function and then calling that library itself. But that's uh, basically all you have to do for it. Um, and then you have to make it available in JavaScript. So that's the other part. This image is the one that I'm going to show on the in the browser as a WebP image. Um, yeah, so you have to show it in the browser. So it seems like a, quite a bit of code, but uh, a lot of this is so. This is all JavaScript loading the image into a into a plain image data object. So this is a uh, so this is an image data object. Um, there is a lot of things. Like, so this one is it uses the same C wrap function I just showed you to wrap the C code into a, into a JavaScript function reference. And of course, every function needs to be referenced. So I just put them here. Uh, for all As in, could you this. start wrapping it up, by the way? <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up. Yes. Thanks. Um, you can read it yourself. I made some documentation there. So I'll just wrap it up by running the command You can see a couple of extra arguments like allow memory growth, and that's what you need to do the, the memory allocation, of course. Um, let me see. Once I get started talking, then it's always uh, it takes longer than I think it will. I'm sorry, Christian. Um, no problem. <laughs> it's interesting, so it's all good. Yeah, as you can see, it's a uh, compiling now. It should take a couple of seconds uh, more. There we go. 
so it compiled it. We have the result here. Another wasm that has come out. Um, this one, yeah, it's a 250 kilobytes. Uh, so that contains that library. Um, of course, here we also want to start that server. There we go. And if I open it, then I should see the image. Uh, and also that the API version that is printing is uh, 1.2.2. Uh, you can check my source code. There is no 1.2.2 in there. Uh, just for uh, not even encrypted. Um, yeah, so it loaded uh, the wasm in there. Uh, so I thought this is actually pretty cool. I don't see a use case for loading a library that optimizes images for use through the web. But because now you're downloading actually your original image and then doing all the conversion client side, so then it doesn't optimize anything. But yeah, that's maybe beside the point. Uh, we can do it, so we will. Uh, like installing Windows on a, on a PlayStation. Um, I think those are the main two demos. Um, unless you really want to see Blazor, but I think, yeah, we can also do that afterwards uh, if someone still in, is interested. But it's not as, that's nearly as interesting words. as this one. <laughs> that's your death words indeed, that time. All right, that's it, right? <laughs> that's Thank it. you. Yes. <laughs> Great presentation, like the talk. Uh, please give some applause to Edwin. <laughs> he showed us a lot. There were also uh, great Photoshop uh, guys going. So I'm already testing it out. So that's really cool as well. I'm still surprised that it can run in the browser because usually when I open Photoshop, uh, my PC turns into an airplane. Uh, so interesting that it works onto the browser. <laughs> um, there are a few questions. So uh, we have some time to uh, handle that. We go a bit further into the break. The first question is from Ankit. Ankit, maybe you want to unmute yourself and ask a question uh, by yourself, if that's possible. Yes, uh, Edwin, when you showed uh, uh, Adobe was taking 11 MB uh, to download. So then I, then I thought, does it also have a lazy loading uh, as well? Somehow, yeah, somehow. there is a so for AutoCAD, I actually got the reference through some uh, some questions they started asking in communities, and one of them was actually on the lazy loading part. But uh, yeah, for so for things like uh, wasn't they first have it's because it's a binary, so they have to load in the whole binary before they can uh, can start anything. Um, yeah, so you, it does have to be downloaded first before it can be used. Uh, so they, what they were looking at is uh, cutting up one uh, wasm file into several ones, uh, but then having them communicate through together and sharing memory spaces, etc. It gets a very difficult uh, or impossible to do so. Yeah. So there are uh, some limit. So far there are limitations. I know that they're also working on multi-threading and all these type of things, but it's not. Um, then you also get into a whole security, uh, uh, yeah, a, a security hell. So they, it's still not there yet. Yeah, thanks. Great. There are also some questions from Tom Cool. Tom, if you want to unmute yourself, that's possible. I'll wait a few seconds, or else I will just uh, read it out loud. It's definitely possible. Yeah, nice. Great to hear. Yeah, the the one thing I'm really curious about is is do we gain performance uh, over over JavaScript? Uh, can it be faster, uh, or do you still have to design your application, your Wasm application, with 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 this performance in mind? Do do, do we, yeah, is, do we gain any performance there? It's um, yeah, maybe Michael has a bit more insight into that uh, than me. I I do know that. Uh, was yeah. yeah you you can I get you also use it for I see the question on uh, can wasm access the DOM and uh, yeah so 
I think also what uh, what they're doing at AutoCAD is supplying uh, basically libraries, etc., to uh, to a JavaScript application. But I think Michael, you will have some more insight into uh, where it is more efficient to use. Yeah, not directly in the presentation itself, but I can say something about it. It because it depends. Um, it, it, uh, JavaScript itself is can be also quite uh, quite speedy uh, nowadays. But the one of the advantages with with WebAssemb that WebAssembly has is that WebAssembly doesn't have the warm up time that is needed for JavaScript to be fast, for example. And, Java, and WebAssembly WebAssembly is much more consistent in its speed. So you probably still need to optimize. Um, your WebAssembly, but it, it really depends what you're doing. Larger larger calculations will probably be faster anyway. But yeah, a very small program, one function that only does one small thing, then you have much more overhead because you need to call that function from JavaScript, for example, if you're talking about the yeah, okay. application. So it doesn't really outperform JavaScript in that sense, but you still and you still yeah. have to develop your application with this performance in mind, right? So yeah, it doesn't solve that speed thing. It, it can for sure uh, beat uh, JavaScript, but it really depends what you're doing. Yeah, OK. Thanks. Cool. Uh, thanks, uh, Tom. Awesome. Uh, Tim, you also had a question. You can uh, mute yourself and ask it directly to Edwin if you want to. If not, I will answer it. Yeah, hi. So you could run Photoshop in your browser, I just saw. But why would you do that? I know it's just a gimmick, but is it really functional? Would it would yeah. work better than Photoshop itself? If, if you're delivering Photoshop uh, as a company, then uh, then you might want to provide it in a browser. Yeah, but does I it think it's that, that it, better? you don't have to install it. They can uh, they can offer it as a service and have that same rich experience. And if you have to write a separate Photoshop in JavaScript itself, it will take or type. Uh, if you have to write it with that, then uh, it takes well uh, a lot of code basically. Um, so it's basically so a lot of uh, reusing the code, especially for the algorithms. And you can think of uh, things like AutoCAD as well. You have to do a lot of 3D calculations, and yeah, you really want to reuse your the code that you already have in the application. So if you can, then that will save you a lot of effort re rewriting it in uh, in JavaScript. Yeah, that's definitely true. Thanks. Yeah, it's also you're not supplying the whole application into your browser, right? You're supplying uh, the the function libraries, but it's still so it has uh, uh, an HTML JavaScript it has wrap uh, around it. Uh, nice. Awesome. Uh, great, Edwin. Thanks. Uh, I think let's handle the last question and then we'll go to Michael. We will skip the break because we're uh, running out of time and it's still interesting, so that's great. Uh, Martin Spearings, if you want to ask a question by yourself, that's also possible. Two, three, four. Uh, well, the question of Martin was, uh, when do you expect to be ready for production? So I yeah, think I for production think environments. That is uh, the, the lazy loading, uh, right? So uh, yeah, so WebAssembly is ready for production, uh, so you can use it everywhere. But that lazy loading part, uh, there is really an active discussion on it. So yeah, no one will have an answer for that. Uh, I know that they are thinking about it, but yeah, it's a, it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult thing. Awesome. All right, thanks everybody for being so interactive. I hope you like it so far. Uh, thank you, Edwin, again. <laughs> it was great to have a cool introduction um, and we will continue. We will not do the break, as I mentioned just, uh, just now. Um, Michael, if it's okay for you, you can start sharing your screen and everybody give yep. an applause for Michael. <laughs> All right. Hi, well, hell, hi. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome to my presentation about uh, developing a visual WebAssembly compiler in the browser. Um, my name is uh, Michael van der Lisdonk. I'm 48 years old. I'm uh, currently a freelance uh, software developer since 2012, but I'm already uh, developing since, since I was 12 years old. I started on the Commodore 64. And although that, although that might not be so interesting, 
I did learn some stuff uh, in that uh, time, which I which come handy when learning WebAssembly. So that's quite uh, quite nice, I think. Um, I live in Zeist together with my with my wife, and uh, these are my contact details. If you have some questions uh, later on, uh, but that's for uh, for later. All right. First of all, what is a Visual WebAssembly compiler? Basically, it's a nodes and wire interface that compiles to WebAssembly and executes it. And this is uh, how it looks. So uh, these are the nodes that you can um, you can move, and uh, the wires are the connections uh, which help the program uh, navigate from step to step. And this is something that I built myself. Like, and this um, uh, this is a React application. I will show you show you the architecture a little bit to dive in a little bit deeper before I show you uh, the application. Um, I use a component, a component that I built for the editor. That's the Flow Runner Canvas editor, which is um, a React component. Um, and the Visual WebAssembly compiler uses that component to, um, uh, to build on, uh, on further on. Uh, I have built uh, the, the React, uh, um, sorry. Um, the Visual App Assembler compiler is a normal React app, which I scaffolded with the Create React app. I will not show you that, but that's just uh, just to know that. Um, there's this. Um, there's some steps in it to go from the Visual Flow to the WebAssembly, and uh, the WebAssembly is run by JavaScript. And the webs and the JavaScript calls the WebAssembly, and it uses its output to show that on in various ways on the screen. And today I will show you something very small in the console application, and I will show you something bigger as, as my last demo with the GL Canvas uh, demo. Uh, the flows are stored uh, in local storage so that I don't have to uh, save them on the disk. And everything is happening in memory of the browser. This editor, by the way, can also run standalone, but that's not what I'm doing here. It, uh, the editor is available on uh, on my GitHub, but I'm not actively um, promoting it. But I will share the link uh, with you. So um, you might ask yourself, why am I developing a Visual WebAssembly compiler? Or why am I developing a visual programming environment uh, anyway? Well, I like to keep my knowledge up to date. And uh, I, uh, because in the in my day to day job, I learn also learn, learn a lot, of course. But there are things that I cannot do uh, in my uh, in my uh, day uh, in my daily jobs. And I think and uh, I have a lot of fun uh, doing it. And uh, why am I developing a visual uh, programming environment? Well, um, code in itself is very powerful and has no limitations, but it can be complex, especially when you're new to a bigger code base. Or haven't touched a code base for a while. So, an interactive visual environment can help to understand that code base a lot better. And you can even use it to enable adding new functionality without understanding textual coding. And this might sound a lot, a lot like um, low code or no code environments, environments, but I think it's they can be more powerful if you add some textual coding, which I do with the Visual WebAssembly compiler. And you will see that uh, later on. Okay, now I'm going to show you the smallest program that I can build using the visual environment. And it will be really small. I uh, import uh, an, uh, an empty uh, project. I also, also will also show you how that looks in WebAssembly to uh, give you an idea how that works. How this, uh, how this works. You can drag nodes from this left side and side to, uh, to the canvas. Uh, every program needs a start, so that's this node. Every program also probably needs, needs an ending one day, one way or another. Um, so this is what this uh, node does. It simply does, it, it simply returns a value. And that value is shown over here. Now this can also be an expression with the calculation, but uh, let's leave it at this for now. Um, 
I will need to refresh because the WebAssembly is uh, added over here in the in the inspector of um, of Chrome. You can see that, but since uh, every step gives a new compilation, that's it's a bit uh, yeah, it's a bit chaotic, and you don't know exactly what is the latest version. Normally, you don't have any. Is that that's not a problem? But now it's uh, it's not so. It's uh, good to uh, to refresh. Um, so this is the WebAssembly that was generated by this program. Um, there, are, there are some uh, some more functions that are not used uh, in this program because I always add these uh, uh, to each program currently because um, they are needed for for other things. But uh, just uh, skip that for now. Um, the main bit is uh, is this actually, and this is a very long function with a lot of parameters. And this program also does not use these parameters. Um, but the only thing that happens actually is that this value, this 42, is returned to um, by this function as uh, as a result. And that's what, what the, the, the calling JavaScript uh, uh, gets as a return value. Uh, and you also have to know that WebAssembly only has a couple of data types. It only knows uh, two kind of integers and two kind of floats. So this is a this is a 32 bit integer. But it can also be a 32 bit float. Like this. And that's also why I'm adding other functions. Because in uh, in my last example, you will see that I use uh, do some calculations where I need, for example, a sign operation. WebAssembly can't do a sign of an angle uh, can't calculate the sign of an angle by itself. So all you need to provide that uh, functionality in in the WebAssembly, or you need to use it from JavaScript. And uh, in the examples that uh, Edwin, uh, Edwin sh uh, um, showed us, uh, what, what happens in the example in C, C uh, has a standard library that is also converted to WebAssembly. So that's how uh, they make uh, that kind of uh, functionality available for uh, for C languages, for all the, and that's the same as happening on other uh, other platforms as well, like uh, like Blazor. But uh, my math is not that good that I can implement uh, a sign uh, myself, <laughs> so that's why I do, I do it like this. And I have some a speeding up trick to uh, to make it faster. And uh, I hope I remember that uh, to show it to you. Okay, um, but uh, yeah, still this 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 program does nothing, of course. But how can you handle external input? Uh, I have this special node, which uh, I can um, add form controls uh, on. I call this slider. It's a slider uh, form control. Default value is 50. Start at zero. Maximum is 100. Um, if I do like this. Then, if I slide this, then you see this value uh, moving, which is uh, the result of 42 times the result, the value of that slider. So that that slider, that name, that's also a variable that you can use in this expression. And because I'm compiling this flow to WebAssembly, I can uh, turn, I can use that, I can use that value. Well, let me refresh uh, again. And now what you can see is that this main function has got an, an extra parameter. Well, I didn't show you all, all those parameters, so you, you can't see, you don't know, of course, but this variable 12 was not there yet, was not there uh, just now, it's now there. And that's where that, that, uh, fifth, that, that slider value is, uh, is passed into. And you can use that in, um, in your calculations. Um, yeah, so what, that's basically what's happening here and how this works. The WebAssembly is a stack stack based machine. That's also what you hear uh, often. Um, so what is happening is that these 42 and these far, this value, the value of this far 12 are put on the stack. And this multiply operation expects two values to be on the stack. And if it's not there, then you get an error. Uh, and it returns the result of that calculation on the stack, and that's 
then again, the result of that main function, because that main function also expects a value to be on the stack, so it can, can return it. Just a moment. So WebAssembly itself is very low level. Um, but how is this, this WebAssembly ac uh, executed by JavaScript? Well, I will show you. Normally, you have a WASM file, what you just saw in the presentation from Edwin. Um, and this is a very simple example. Um, what this does, it fetches the file log.wasm log from the network. And when it has been fetched, it uh, this uh, uh, it uh, it's because it's a promise it it resolves, and this instantiate streaming method is a, that's something from the WebAssembly API which is in the browser that uh, receives uh, those values, and you can then uh, in in this then uh, um, function you can uh, uh, when this resolves you can execute the function that's in that wasm file. So to also answer a bit more that question about that 11 megabyte uh, wasm file, in in theory, in theory, what can happen is that during the the the, the streaming of that uh, that big file, it can already the the browser can already start uh, uh, preparing it or even run it, and I don't know if for of uh, if Photoshop of uh, Photoshop AutoCAD or Photoshop is doing that, but that. That's that is at least uh, the attention of this uh, instantiate streaming method, so that it's to improve that speed uh, a little bit. But um, in my uh, visual WebAssembly compiler, I'm not using this actually. I'm doing something different because um, I'm um, compiling the the WebAssembly in memory, and I use a different method. Um, what you see here is actually the binary form of WebAssembly. Uh, and I will show you a little bit more about it in a few uh, in a minute. Um, that WebAssembly compiler that I built is preparing this, uh, the, the WebAssembly in this format. So not in the text format that you saw, but in this raw binary format. And that's just put in an, in an array. And WebAssembly API also has another method, the instantiate method. That you can give it an array directly, and uh, it compile. It it also needs to compile this uh, this data to uh, to something that the computer understands. But yeah, that's how that's how I do how, how I do it in the WebAssembly compiler. And to um, look again at that picture, I had this um, I have this block over here. What is happening in the in the compiler? That that flow that you uh, that you just saw that's uh, that's actually a JSON flow, but that that's what needs to happen is that that flow needs to be converted to uh, an intermediate language, an intermediate textual language. That is being tokenized and passed. And I'm not going to dive into this, but that's act the actually compiling part, and that's and after that the WebAssembly, the raw WebAssembly is generated. So you need to do to do quite some steps before you have that raw WebAssembly. And these are usually the things that, uh, that except for example, the C compiler does. But in this uh, environment, I'm doing this in the in the browser itself in memory. I have uh, in the presentation um, uh, some links uh, on the course how this works because it's it's uh, it will take too long to uh, to explain that uh, probably. But it's uh, always interesting to uh, to dive into that. I think. I never wrote a compiler uh, before I did this. So, uh, that's why uh, I thought was quite interesting. Um, to do, uh, if, let's see. Okay, when uh, when we say uh, WebAssembly is a binary format, what does that mean? If you look at it a little bit deeper, um, because the WebAssembly that that you see here is a textual format, and uh, the compiler is making this of it, but yeah. How? Yeah. How, do, how does that? What? Uh, what is it exactly? Well, at least I'm, I'm not going to uh, talk about every byte in here. But there's this website called uh, Code Explorer. You can load in a WASM file, a binary WASM file, 
and what it will do. It will uh, show you um, how that looks. And these numbers, this is uh, hexadecimal data. And I'm not sure if everybody here is familiar with hexadecimal data. Maybe you know it from, from color codes, but uh, it's basi basically a different representation of numbers. And uh, it's, uh, it's a nice way to, uh, to write because you can put um, a single byte into two uh, two characters, and that nice uh, aligns nicely if you need to read uh, something like this. So uh, that's about that. Uh, but how you can see this, the, was the WASM file consists of different sections. This first part is a fixed header of eight bytes uh, with a version number, and these other sections that are uh, this, for example, are the the function types that are in um, in the WASM file because WASM is uh, strongly typed. Also, the, the functions. So you need, also need to provide what what kind of parameters and how much parameters a function has. Although, uh, yeah, the parameters itself can only be uh, currently only be, be four types. Uh, and then the which for, which functions are are imported, um, what what uh, what is exported, what how is the memory uh, defined, and and then the final code because that this is the this is the only code this is the code actually that's in this file the rest is all uh, extra information so webassembly is very compact so even though it can get very big if you have something like uh, autocad with that 11 uh, megabytes file it can also be very small and still be quite powerful Um, now, if you want to uh, put something on the screen from WebAssembly, how can you do that? So the most simple example that I can show is how you can put something um, on in the console. And the last example you will see, see uh, a bit more, but it's also possible. Uh, I need this example. What um, what I did here, I am um, I also have this. Um, this log function that's being imported, and that's a, that's a JavaScript function that receives a single number, and it outputs that number to the console. So by importing this, you can call that function from within, um, yeah, from within this uh, immediate language format. And this is the, actually the language that I built myself. Which is getting compiled to uh, to WebAssembly, although it looks it looks a lot like uh, other languages. Um, nothing nothing special actually, but so what I do here, I call the log function, and uh, the compiler knows knows that this log function, and what it what uh, what is happening if you see this look at this program in WebAssembly. There's somewhere there is a call. Function. Let me look where it is. Uh, yeah, here it is. This 303 is a constant. It's uh, put there as a float, and it the WebAssembly calls that log function. Because WebAssembly itself cannot talk to the DOM, the document object model. It cannot access any API from the browser. So you need to um, you need to provide that. If you, even um, Adding a diff uh, a diff element to uh, to the to the DOM, that's not possible from uh, from within WebAssembly itself. So you need you need uh, currently still need JavaScript uh, for that. And um, now you can you wonder now you could ask yourself, okay, what? But yeah, it's nice that you have uh, integers and floats, but yeah, we we need in our pro daily day to day programs we need much more complex uh, structures like objects or arrays or strings. And uh, WebAssembly itself, it doesn't know strings. It doesn't even know arrays. But still, uh, you can run AutoCAD. So what is what's going on? Um, WebAssembly has memory. Although you need to um, how you handle that memory, that's up to you. Um, if you, of course, if you're using C, then C gives you a lot of uh, uh, yeah, a lot of functionality that you can access that memory. Uh, uh, yourself, although still you need to uh, allocate it. It's, it's not that uh, that that easy as uh, you're used to. 
in my uh, in in my example, um, I have no uh, uh, no memory access, no no real good memory access. I have some, but I did uh, what because what you need to do, uh, how it works, uh, you have in WebAssembly you have memory and you have code, and if you want to use memory, you need to even specify how much memory you uh, you you want to use. So I can in this environment I can specify the number of pages, and one page is um, 64K, so uh, 10 pages is uh, 640,000 uh, uh, bytes. So that's what I got available, but how I want to, how I want to use that is up to me. Um, what I can do, I have this special instruction where, which I can specify um, a name uh, and uh, a size and um, a type. So what the compiler does, it uh, allocates uh, 128 floats and links that to the name test. And if I name, use this test in my program, then, uh, then, then, then I can access memory. And what I did in this very simple example, I retrieved the pointer to the test, um, test memory, uh, and I'm going to store um, the results of a simple calculations there. And you even need to calculate the address of that of where you want to store it, because here I'm looping to uh, 128 values, uh, and I want to store it yeah, on each location of that test. Like like you have an array, I want to store uh, the, the, this results there. And uh, you even need to keep in mind that how big a float is. Float a 32-bit float is four bytes, so that's why you need to multiply this by four. So if you want to write WebAssembly yourself, then you really have to dive quite deep. Um, all right. Let's see. We're going to the end, but um, we're not there yet. I will show you the last example. Um, just a moment. Now, uh, in this third example, uh, you see how data is rendered using WebGL. Uh, the anim animation that you see here is the Game of Life algorithm that's invented by John Conway in uh, 1970. Uh, it's um, for each iteration of the Game of Life, um, for each cell is determined if if it lives or dies, and a cell is is a cube in this in this case. And uh, that uh, there are some there was a set of rules at, uh, because what happens is that uh, that uh, in the, for the algorithm you look you look at the neighbors of a cell and depending on some rules you determine if uh, if a cell uh, lives or dies and you can uh, have some patterns and this pattern just keeps on running but you can also have patterns that that have that go uh, that, that if you run the, the game of life algorithm hundred times then. Then it's then it's stable. Then you just see one block, or it, there's nothing anymore. I have a link uh, in the in the final presentation where you can read more about it. But it's a simple algorithm. But it uh, it needs uh, a couple of things like state management, condition checking, loops, grid a grid data data structure, and and some basic math. And if you uh, combine that with a 3D visualization, you have a great way to uh, to test the programming environment. I think. So also, if you dive into the programming language Rust with WebAssembly, you also uh, have some kind of an example like this. But um, what um, what is going on here? This program, this uh, this executes uh, the Game of Life algorithm, but it also calculates uh, all um, all that is needed for this visualization, it, and it, it does not do the WebGL. Um, does not call the Web, WebGL APIs directly. That's happening from JavaScript, but it calculates all of the matrices that are needed for uh, for this DDA, DDA uh, presentation. Because for 3D, you need a lot of uh, matrices. You need a projection projection matrix for this uh, perspective view. Also, uh, when I move uh, the the mouse over here, the, the mouse pointer is is used for uh, for a camera. So that's also being calculated. Uh, every cube has uh, has a position, a scale, and that's that's also being handled by uh, by matrices, and that is done by this by this program. 
and um, all that data is um, is put into memory of WebAssembly. So um, the same as I saw in the previous recent pre previous uh, pro uh, example, but now a little bit bigger list. There's a lot of uh, memory allocated for um, yeah, for 64 uh, cells of each uh, of for the game of life, but also uh, the, the matrices. And there are, are actually actually 65 objects in this uh, in this uh, uh, animation. Although uh, you see uh, only cubes, which are 64 cubes, although they are not all uh, all being drawn. And there's the uh, the ground, which is also an object. So this this is all being prepared in this uh, in this flow, and uh, you can uh, there's also more um, variables over here that you can uh, uh, can play with a little bit, for uh, can play a little bit with the light day, light uh, lighting for example, and these uh, these parameters are passed to that function that you saw earlier, so that you can use these variables in this in this flow. Um, but this is still 11K. And uh, you can see a little bit, uh, yeah, perhaps it's not really smooth at your side. I'm not, I'm not sure, but uh, on my, uh, on my computer this is quite, uh, quite smooth. Uh, and it's, it only takes a couple of milliseconds for each uh, iteration. It's, it's, it's not, uh, it's, I think it's not 60 uh, frames a second, but it's com it comes close. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, let's see if I can, have I got an example of how this deeper works? No, I don't. But, um, basically all those matrices are, uh, it are all float 32 arrays in, in, ja in JavaScript. So that's how it is being passed to, um, uh, to WebGL, yeah. I was forgetting this uh, this diagram. So uh, this gives a bit of an overview how that how that application works together with the JavaScript. Um, so every for every frame, um, there's this request animation frame is, that's being used. That you can use that to to um, do something on every frame um, of your computer. Um, the WASM module uh, is called. WebAssembly module. The calculations are being done in mem WebAssembly memory, and all this data is being passed to WebGL via uh, float32 uh, arrays, and WebGL passes that that to uh, to the GPU, to, to the shaders. Uh, there are excellent libraries actually for handling WebGL, although I'm not using them uh, in this example. It's all uh, all custom code, although I wouldn't recommend that. But it's an, I think it's a nice combination that you can use um, um, WebAssembly, which is near native uh, performance together with, with a bit of JavaScript and uh, code on the, GP, on the GPU. So you, you can do quite powerful things uh, nowadays uh, on, uh, on computers. And that's also what, uh, what, what those other examples use. Those, uh, if you wonder how, how is that performance, uh, how can Aut AutoCAD be performant or, uh, or, or Figma or uh, Photoshop in the browser, that's... Also, what they actually do, they also use uh, uh, code on the GPU and in combination with uh, with raw raw buffers uh, to uh, yeah to to have yeah JavaScript do as little as possible, only be a, a pass pass through. All right, I'm. Uh, it's uh, what? Um, yeah, for me, this is uh, the end for the presentation. Some conclusions. <laughs> Don't write WebAssembly by hand. Although, yeah, it, it, I'm doing it because I, uh, yeah, because I can, and I like it. I, I, uh, I nowadays I, I never write uh, assembly code. Uh, I did that uh, 35 years ago on, on that Commodore 64 that I was talking about, and now I just wrote that compiler. But in, the, in my day-to-day -day projects, I don't uh, do this. And if I will ever uh, use WebAssembly in uh, in practice, then uh, then for sure I will use something like Rust or, uh, or Blazor because writing it uh, directly is, is absolutely not uh, efficient. So as I mentioned also as a question on the, one of the questions, it has, WebAssembly has no access to DOM uh, or other APIs, at least not yet. 
I've heard some stuff that they are thinking about it, but yeah, security is a is a big thing. That's one of the powers of um, of WebAssembly, the, the the security model, and that comes actually from the fact that memory and code are separated. Um, in normally, when you have a C program that gets compiled to uh, something that runs on your on your computer, you can uh, and you have a buffer overflow, for example. Then, yeah, what what's happening there is that uh, that with other code, memory is accessed and is accessed, and your code is being changed. And that's not something that can happen in WebAssembly because it's strictly uh, separated. And WebAssembly is generally faster than JavaScript, but it, it is, but at least it is uh, consistent. And I don't have any numbers uh, on that, but um, yeah, it, it, and for sure in the in the future it will be more, uh, more. More powerful and more uh, faster because um, of parallel processing with uh, with SIMD and uh, and threading, so that will uh, definitely happen. But I think it can already be uh, much much faster than JavaScript ca uh, can. Uh, but I think one of the most powers, uh, most uh, powerful things is that it enables other languages in the browser besides uh, JavaScript, and that you can use WebAssembly itself on much different platforms than only the web. So that's uh, that's it for for me. Thank you for watching. If you have some questions, then don't hesitate. I hope I can answer them. <laughs> awesome, Michael. Please give him a great applause for that super deep dive. Uh, I loved it. Truly magnificent to see how much love, effort, and knowledge you've shared with us. To see this amazing project uh, in play as well. Really cool demo. Uh, I've mm -hmm. at least learned a few things, but I will for sure rewatch it again because it was a lot for, of information for me. Uh, awesome to see uh, these kind of things. I really like the project. Are I hope you I didn't questions? go too fast. But, uh... <laughs> no, you didn't go too fast. You gave it a clear view. Also, if the diagrams it really helped, that was also one of my comments in the chat. I think visual clues is really nice if you want to explain a new code base or some pattern or project to somebody, then it's really good to have it. <laughs> Are there any questions? Because I don't think I've seen them in the chat. There was one uh, from yep. me. Yeah, uh, yeah my, my question was actually if you could also use uh, this whole visual uh, way of programming for languages other than WebAssembly as well. Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I can't, I'm not going to show that here, but um, the Actually, that uh, that component that I was talking about, this um, Flow Runner Canvas editor, mm -hmm. um, it um, yeah, it, you can use it actually to uh, to uh, doesn't really matter because it can uh, what it what it basically does. It outputs um, JSON. Uh, let's see, I've got an example over here somewhere. Uh, This is actually the the output of the of the editor, which is uh, JSON data. So every node and every connection are in here. Also, oh, yeah. uh, for a connection, you have uh, a start and end shape. Um, and yeah, this WebAssembly compiler. Uh, yeah, I've uh, in this project I've implemented uh, these uh, these special nodes for um, uh, for WebAssembly, but. Uh, uh, perhaps it's better if I show it anyway. Doesn't really matter. Um, this is the editor that you are seeing over here, but targeting JavaScript itself. And this is this flow is run um, in the in the browser. Uh, but this also could this this uh, this pro this application that I built in the backend. There's also a flow uh, that's being handled that's being handled. Uh, by uh, yeah, in this case PHP, but uh, I also built that flow of that of the the API that's behind this application with uh, with my own editor. So definitely, it can uh, target uh, the editor can definitely target other languages, not just WebAssembly. But that's probably something for uh, a whole uh, other talk. <laughs> <laughs> for another cool. time. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so basically, the moment you decided I want to use this for JavaScript, you you went writing notes that you thought, oh, this is useful if I want to write JavaScript. 
or uh, create JavaScript applications using my visual editor, you have to make those notes. And if you, uh, if you use them, then convert it to actually JavaScript. Um, yeah, the, um, in this case, I built a compiler that um, uh, this part, but, but uh, how, this, how this component works, you can, um, it can run standalone. And in that case, it, it does the, the JavaScript thing, it, thing, it fully runs on JavaScript, but you can uh, listen to events that on everything that you, and what then happens is that when you change something in that flow, uh, that event is called and you can do uh, which, what you want with that flow. And in this case, it triggers a compilation, a compilation process. So that flow gets, uh, the JSON flow gets, gets converted to a textual format. And part of the textual format are also in the, in the I also use, use in the notes. And that, yeah, and that is, is further uh, compiled to, uh, to WebAssembly. But I could also uh, pass this flow to, uh, to some C-sharp and handle the, that flow in C-sharp, for example. Right. If you can read JSON in the, in the language, then you could, uh, could do with that uh, what you want. All right, cool. And uh, another question, but I didn't put that in the chat, but I see a lot of examples uh, of uh, WebAssembly for like big applications like Photoshop or visual things or 3D or rendering and those kind of things. Would WebAssembly also be useful for like, if you want just want to make a website or small application, or is it mainly targeting like those real Photoshop-like applications in the browser? Mm. Well, I, I, it depends on what you want to do on your website, but probably um, probably you you want to use uh, WebAssembly for that. But um, what well, I can you I can see an advantage with uh, with Blazor, for example, with um, uh, with regards to WebAssembly, and uh, if you compare that to uh, to JavaScript, because probably a lot of you are are writing uh, um, front end applications for big companies. In JavaScript, uh, but you need to be quite uh, quite good at it to uh, to be uh, efficient at it. And it might be for a uh, for a company, it might be cheaper. Uh, yeah, maybe cheaper is not the right, correct word, but uh, more efficient to uh, to have your applications being written in uh, in the language which, like C Sharp, but that it runs in the browser. That's something that Blazor, yeah, uh, for example. Uh, so. Enables. I also think so with uh, with the Blazor, yeah, you have the benefit that you can, uh, well, also share code, right, between the back end and the front end. That's uh, the, the demo that I had for Blaze. But it's basically, and that's why it's interesting that all these languages from Kotlin to uh, uh, to C to Prolog and uh, Python and everything is supported. That means that you can share the code that you write in Python for the backend. So for example, if you do validation on objects, then you can also copy that code and have it already running the front end, for example. Uh, all these type of things you can do. Which, uh, yeah, then you don't have to write JavaScript for it. So a lot of functionality you can already provide in the form of libraries to your front end. And I think that will make that can also make it more efficient yeah. that you have another means of uh, transporting it. All right, cool, thanks. Awesome, guys. All right. It's, uh, it's even in uh... a data type deduplication, right? So if you have data types that uh, that you're using in the back in uh, in your back end. Uh, you can use a lot of it uh, in the front end as well. Awesome, great. All right, guys, uh, great session. Let's wrap it up. Uh, it's getting late already, but I think we will uh, remember this for a long time. Some awesome sessions, but for next time, we want to improve, of course. Uh, we have a small feedback form. There will be no user data. We just want to improve and get your feedback on everything we are doing. So next time we can do it even a bit better. Uh, there's also a chance to win a prize. Uh, you can optionally choose that. Um, then the only thing you need to leave is your email. You will not be contacted for anything else but the prize if you win. Um, so yeah, that will be great. We will send the link uh, in a few seconds. 
After that, some uh, next meetup announcements. I already showed you the program, uh, but next one will be hybrid and front-end architecture. Uh, the subjects will be revealed in the coming few weeks. Um, interesting as well, there are Soci speakers and external speakers, just like now, uh, Adrian was from Soci, Michael was external, and they both delivered uh, awesome stuff. Uh, so that's really great to see. If you want to present, you can contact us. Uh, that would be awesome if you know some cool topics as well or think like, hey, we want to know more about that. That's also possible. Please just contact us. Well, Michael and Edwin, thank you for this great uh, evening. It was really awesome to see such a cool subject, uh, learn more about it and have an interesting time as well. Um, please, oh, applause for them. And um, if you want to stay, you can stay for a bit if you have any questions. If not, enjoy the evening. And see you, of course, at the next Lightning Talks. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs> That's awesome.